This video is sponsored by Buckstar Games for the Bargainomicon and Hexpedition Jaws of the King, which means there will be an ad for them somewhere near the middle of the video. All right, disclaimer right up front because I don't want this to be the whole subject of this video. Discourse around this book has gotten volatile and ridiculous, and it isn't all Wizards of the Coast's fault this time. Every conversation about this system feels like someone's trying to poke holes and find gotchas in the reviewer's content, and we're just not able to speak plainly. It's gotten to the point where I'm asked genuine questions about the release and gotten cynical, accusatory hostility in response. However, I have thousands of people asking my opinion about this update, so I'm trying to make my audience happy here. Not Wizards of the Coast, my viewers. Now, to that point, not every single video has to bring up the sins of Wizards of the Coast or entertain speculative conspiracy theories. If I'm doing this as objectively as I can, I'm going to have to ignore multiple instances of ash holish behavior from this company for the sake of this video. I won't be bringing up the heavy push for digital and monetization or the aggressive legal tactics of WotC beyond this disclaimer. Are they going all digital? Whatever the answer, I don't care, and you really shouldn't either. Just because the people that are torchbearing this IP that has 50 years of history doesn't necessarily mean that Wizards of the Coast taking this into a digital format affects anything else that you want to play. Either it happens or it doesn't, and that's going to be the move that they're going to make. There's plenty of purely analog TTRPGs, so it's not like you're being held captive until you pay the Watsi microtransaction tax. The reaction towards their push for digital are just inane and not helping address the actual quality decline of Wizards of the Coast since 2019. If you think there's value in objective reviews like this, I need to be able to talk about the quality of this product without the disagreements on business ethics. This is a beef-free review, and there's still plenty to be said while we're keeping it vegan here. To that end, I do reviews, and reviews without honest critique are advertisements. Drinking that toxic positivity Kool-Aid doesn't give you the moral high ground. Crybullying damages this hobby in a way that shuts out the voices of those who want to see things improve. Dungeon tubers have made tons of videos covering all kinds of things that they're enthusiastic about. But D&D is the thing that overwhelmingly takes views away from everything else, and watching a continuous stream of misery is going to affect your YouTube recommendations. Corpos want nothing more than unquestioning whales buying all the shit they can shovel out, and dismissing all criticism as hate or negativity is playing right into their hands. I don't believe a review's job is to convince, it's to inform, and that information might be convincing, but to start from the basis of trying to convince people is biased. You're hearing my opinions on things, but you will always spend your money how you want to. Stop calling the ethics of a review in the question just because it's not smoking the same hype pack as you. Now, as far as this review goes, I did not receive a copy of this book for free, and I was not contacted about covering this by Wizards of the Coast. If you know my history, that shouldn't be a surprise to you. The perspective I bring is as a critically acclaimed, award-winning game designer who made eight classes for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition with over 50,000 combined sales of my TTRPG products. I've designed third-party supplements for other systems as well, and I have a decade of experience in print production and product management. I've run thousands of hours of 5e, including for Adventurers League and at conventions. D&D was my mainstay system for years, but I'm now running my own system Vagabond, as well as Dragonbane, Merkborg, Shadowdark, and Vossen. I've spent months researching this update for my own work, and have spent the last week researching the book for this video. I gave way more off-the-cuff thoughts on a, like first impressions during a 10-hour livestream, but this is after I've gotten some time to sit with it, collect my thoughts, and kind of get some more general ideas on it. What this won't be is a deep dive into every change that has happened. There's already videos out there by the likes of Colby from D4 Deep Dive, Dungeon Dudes, Pointy Hat, Tree and Monk, and D&D Shorts that cover it in exhaustive detail. I'm going to link all those down below. I'm also going to link my brother in homebrew, Kibble's Tasty's thread, on his deep dive thoughts for another perspective from a different third-party designer. This video is an overview of my thoughts as a system designer and product developer. I'm really trying to keep this light on the edits and seeing as Wizards of the Coast is revising their policy on what content they might strike a channel for makes me reluctant to give any visual aid from inside of the book now. We'll go cut and dry through the good and the bad, but I'll drop my summary first. Ultimately, D&D 2024 is the most definitionally mixed bag I've ever reviewed, at least with just looking at the player's handbook. Since this is the main representation of the system core, I'm going to feel fine speaking fairly generally about the entire endeavor from this book. The cleaner elements of the presentation and verbiage of modern Dungeons & Dragons is extremely welcome. There are several rules changes made that I think should absolutely overwrite the 5e versions. The art is a fantastic facelift, and everything here looks gorgeous. But we're talking about a rulebook for a game, not an art book. 
There are clearly some smart design decisions here that could have led to something good or even great, but it feels fairly self-evident that the design team was not given enough time to cook. The attempts to keep things backwards compatible have been messy and confusing, and ultimately still leaves true compatibility as a moving goalpost. While people online might answer that it's very clear how this compatibility is or is not to work, I'll still say that it should be able to self-contain this within the rulebook, and we shouldn't have to be hunting around on YouTube videos or whatever interviews, scouring the internet just to just to know how to interpret this game. Maybe this whole thing could be justified if it improved 5e's sluggish combat pillar, shallow exploration pillar, and empty social pillar, but it doesn't. At the end of the day, this is a better look for the rules, but it's not a better execution. It's also apparent from the amount of broken combinations being discovered that there's still more to be found. At any table that has even the slightest munchkin proclivities, this version might be their dream. To me, it's an omen for obnoxious um actually isms, and I'm just tired of the vibe. For years, I went to 5e's defense claiming power creep wasn't a thing that could exist in a cooperative game, but with this, I'm seeing how woefully wrong I was. Right, so I'm not coming up with any kind of metric that people are going to be like all upset about or arguing in the comment sections anymore. I'm just kind of sick and tired of that with this game. So I'm actually just coming up with a totally arbitrary metric here of using grading school mood stickers. I'll mention the aspects of the book that stood out to me for good or for bad and give each a little adhesive picture of joy or despair. We'll just be going through my points as I saw them appear in the book, so you're going to get a mix of the good and the bad at the same time. So the book quality. Beyond the art, the book itself initially felt like an upgrade when I first handled it. The paper stock feels like a slightly rougher texture, but that's almost like saying a Smash Brothers character feels floaty post-patch. I want to say that this is an upgrade from the magazine stock of 5e, but something unfortunate happened with my book. This could be a fluke, but only after having my copy for a day, one of the page spreads started popping out of the signature stitches. Since no one else out there appears to be reporting a similar issue, I'm just going to assume that I have like, I don't know, gorilla hands or something and I mishandled it, and I'm just going to have to deal with that page picking out of the foredge for all the time that I've got it. Anyways, so I'm giving the quality of the book a tasty ice cream. Additionally, they made a change to the body text font. They're now using TT Geniverse instead of Bookmania. Geniverse is a gorgeous choice with a more crisp presentation. The Geniverse family is running about $165, which means that it's pricing out a lot of the homebrewers trying to perfectly emulate the new trade dress. That's a personal quibble for me, it might not mean as much to you, but yeah. Might look at it as a glass half full situation though, since it won't require an Adobe font subscription to use. This sharp look for the new books gets a smiling dog. Okay, keywording. Major mechanical words are displayed with a capitalization that indicates it's referring to a specific rule within the game. This is fantastic and a great move for accessibility. I personally think it could have gone a step further, similar to how Free League does this with Vossen, but this is still progress. This would get higher praise if the only representation for most of these rules wasn't tucked away in the rules glossary at the end of the book, but we'll talk about that later. Silver Star. Right, artwork, I had mentioned this earlier, the artwork throughout the book shows an incredible amount of talent from every artist involved and displays a modern vision for high fantasy roleplay. I had originally criticized the art direction as feeling like League of Legends posed character arts with distinctly zoomer designs and hairstyles, but my problem mostly lied with the characters seeming to just pose at you instead of like high action and combat shots. However, after seeing the pieces that they hadn't shown off in promotional material, I'm happy to be proven only slightly right. These character pieces are pulling this era of Dungeons and Dragons further away from the medieval pulp fantasy of yesteryear. Now, I personally prefer that classic dungeon crawler pulp tone over the sort of Marvel superhero vibe of D&D and Pathfinder, but it's okay and not every game has to, like, tailor itself for my taste. A quick summary in the direction appears to be that the action shots don't depict blood or gore. Of all the pieces in the book, I could probably count on two hands how many of them actually explicitly depict combat. When they do, you'll see bits of non-humanoid characters implied to be getting blown apart, vaporized or destroyed off screen. The most combat violent pieces being a fireball combusting a giant spider, a man being consumed by a hunger of Hadar spell, and a dragon's breath burning a humanoid silhouette. In general, art all around is getting a cold side of the pillow. The rules glossary. This is a thing I love being in this book. I think all TTRPGs that rely on any sort of keywording essentially have to have a section like this glossary. What I didn't expect is that this would be the only presentation of these rules in the book. Instead of printing the rules in a natural order through the book to read, they decided to pull all the explanations here. That means the rules for all the actions, conditions, what certain speed types are, etc. All those rules are only present here, 
not in the chapter that they naturally would correspond to. If you think doing so would make this massive core rulebook already bigger, you'd be correct. However, the fact that they don't do a basic cross-reference for the specific page number in the rules glossary is inexcusable and lazy. I have seen their excuses for why they don't do cross-referencing, and as someone who specializes in layout, their excuses are misinformed at best. If you want to see just how easy this is, I went into my problems with this during a live stream last week, and I've got the clip for all that down in the description below. I actually bring up InDesign and show the cross-referencing method that you can use, and how literally like all their excuses that they've made over the last 10 years are just invalid. This was so close to being a home run, but pulling all the rules away from the natural reading progression and refusing to use cross-references like everyone else in the industry earns them a disappointed dad. Movement. Uh, pretty much all the major operational issues in this update come down to the changes that they made to shoves and kind of questionable as far as mounting goes. We'll talk about this in Unarmed Strikes, but shoves are no longer tied to a contested check and you can choose to fail the saving throw and get pushed up to five feet. This is an easier negotiation, and I'm happy to see it, but it also opened up a bag of holding size can of worms. This change invited bizarre white room interactions that make the classic peasant railgun meme look tame by comparison. Line up those peasants in a one mile line and tell them to ready to shove you. Suddenly, you're teleported a mile in six seconds because you can now choose to fail every single save. I know this is a ridiculous example, okay? But controlled shoves from things you create like animated objects aren't out of the realm of actualization. The positioning required to make this happen likely prevents this from being an objectively better option, but it's still possible, and that should at least be a little bit eyebrow raising. There are theoretical fixes to these interactions, but they're not in this player's handbook, and I'm not a fan of forcing a dungeon master to be the bad guy saying no when the rules should take that heat instead. This gets a confused kitty cat. There's also some oddities with mounting where you can potentially manipulate the initiative order and cheat out some limited actions, reactions, and movement by mounting an ally. Now, this was a thing that existed in D&D 5th edition, so it's really weird that this didn't get fixed here. Basically, it's like this. When you mount a creature, its place in the initiative changes to match yours, and it can act and move normally on that turn. The only actions it can take, though, are dodge, disengage, or dash. If you dismount it by either spending half your speed or punching it to knock it prone because I guess that's a thing now, its position in the initiative doesn't revert, and the system isn't clear as to whether or not it can't use an action or move this round if it already has. Also, because of the wording for reactions, it's possible that this means that you can cheat out multiple reactions each round, since they refresh at the start of your turn without a specific round limiter. It's a case where this rule might work for the intended fantasy of mounting a horse and immediately getting you controlling it, but all of a sudden changes in how the control is passed on to the rider cause a ton of headaches. Straight up, this is just a problem with individual initiative systems. Like, group initiative absolutely fixes this in a way that you just can't top it. I haven't specifically crunched this out, but I'm also really curious if a goliath with some levels into Abjurer Wizard could pop off multiple counter spells and silvery barbs each round just because the party halflings just hopped on their back for a second. Remember this, this initiative order changes anytime something mounts that creature. So, you might be able to cheat out multiple different actions, multiple different reactions, just if your party is all hopping on a centaur or whatever. And since the limiter on casting is one spell slot per turn and not per round, I'm not sure how I'd reasonably say this doesn't work rules as written. I'm actually giving this one an unsettling picture of a horse with a dog's mouth. The exploration section is two pages that reprints the 5e travel and environment rules, and for some reason, still omits foraging hex crawl mechanics, terrain impacts on travel, and the rules for environmental extremes. Difficult terrain is present, but it's in the rules glossary. I don't see a reason why these rules couldn't have gone here instead of staying in the Dungeon Master's Guide like in 5e, especially when this book takes the time to say those rules are in the Dungeon Master's Guide. We have character options that affect these omitted rules, and leaving them out causes more confusion rather than what I think is the intended excuse of preventing players from feeling overwhelmed. I think this is mostly a fault of cramming all this in the chapter one, but I've got to give this a plate of upsetty spaghetti. They're also sticking with the really weird check-based trap investigation instead of encouraging stronger area descriptive text and interactions with the environment. The Finding Hidden Objects header summarizes a lot about what I dislike about 5e's dungeon crawl mechanics. It encourages hiding information behind a check, and WotC has a horrible track record of not keeping check DC wording consistent. If you dabble in the BX derivative OSR games, you'll know what I mean by this. 
By giving stronger descriptions and not tying interaction to specific skill checks, you encourage the party to question the environment and experiment instead of situations like, Hey DM, is there a trap in this corner? Make a perception check. <laughs> four. Oh my god, that actually rolled a four. You don't find anything indicating you think that there's a trap here. Hmm. Can I roll again? I don't Maybe try something different. Okay. I move into the corner. Suddenly, a pressure plate sinks beneath your feet. Poison gas seeping out through the walls. You're dead. This isn't clever. It's frustration due to over-codifying interactions in the system. It's actually removing some choice. Look, this gets so much easier resolved in systems without skills because it essentially forces adventure writers to properly telegraph interactions in the environment. Again, you can always just hand wave the check since that player got specific, but that would mean ignoring this bad habit reinforcing header. They also took the time to write the search action, and it doesn't appear anywhere in this section. Yes, the new search action for this kind of check isn't codified in the section talking about these checks. This gets a dirty ashtray. Now, if that sounds interesting to you and you want to check out some maybe system neutral content that does cover exploration like that, you can pick up Hexpedition Jaws of the King from this video's sponsor, Buckstar Games. This system neutral island hex crawl pits the players in a primeval archipelago where dinosaurs roam and an ancient lost treasure is waiting to be uncovered. With over 100 adventure seeds, multiple random generation roll tables, and a generally lighter touch on system core expectations, this 36 page book can get you hundreds of hours of playable content for D&D, Shadow Dark, Pathfinder, Vagabond, Vanilla Game, Old School Essentials, whatever dragon game system you prefer. Bookstar is also the publisher of Bargainomicon, a unique array of memorable merchants and mercantile based quests. Instead of the party going up against an evil arc wizard or band of goblins this weekend, why not freshen up your palette of villains with the power of capitalism? Shockingly in theme for this video, right? Make sure to use my link down in the description below so they know I sent you. Anyways, thank you to Buckstar Games for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. Okay, social. Look, for as many people that want to say that like D&D is more than just a combat and exploration game, boy, this really makes me think that Wizards of the Coast doesn't think so. The social section of this book has some okay tips for roleplay and ability checks, but that's it. They spend like three pages of that going into how to roleplay out a conversation. An easy home run would have just been to bring back reaction roles, morale, or moving the hirelings table from the equipment section to here but it's left floaty and entirely up to the conversation instead of giving some mechanics that can inspire fantastical twists and inspirations for that conversation. This is just an empty Christmas present. Implementation. This is going to sound like a funny one, but I actually think that it's a plus that after a decade of feedback on the mechanic, inspiration has finally not only been fully implemented as a core part of the system, but features have been created that specifically work with it. This also extends beyond inspiration, as even the most popular house rules have been implemented directly into the game in thoughtful ways. The bonus action potion chug is here, and Thief Rogue's loss of exclusivity got rewarded. The confusion with bonus action to use magic items isn't just clarified, it's here for the better for the thief. This gets a shiny pot of gold. Clipping flavor text. Dude, okay. Some people are going to miss the attempts at flavor text on features, but to me, removing them was one of the best choices they made for this edition. When you've written a game as rules chunky as 5e, flavor text just doesn't have a place anymore, especially when new players just need to get the rules at a glance and understand the mechanic. The features are clean, with an overwhelming majority delivering the <coughs> with an overwhelming majority delivering the punch without the fluff. There's not much more I can say here because this is a shining example of how less is more. This is a gold star for WotC. Okay, I had briefly mentioned unarmed strikes, grapples, and shoves earlier, but I honestly think that of every change that's happened, the changes to unarmed strikes and the rules for grappling and shoves are the most meaningful, graceful, and just greatest facelifts that this update has to offer. For those of you who don't know, you can shove or grapple as an unarmed strike instead of a contested athletics check. This change alone is so massive and such a huge facelift that I can't imagine the mess that is brawling in D&D going any other way from here on out. I'm going to talk about this a bit more in the change to the monk, but this is my S tier change made for this edition and earns a, uh, I don't know, a title belt. Classes. Okay, if I were going to cover my thoughts on classes, that would probably push this video way past what I wanted it to be and more into that deep dive territory. I'm going to try to keep these super, super short. Barbarian. Barbarians are eating extremely well. Primal knowledge is clumsy, but the class is otherwise a glow up for people who want more mechanic to play with. Overall, Barbarian gets a happy Kratos. Bard now functions pretty much as a cleanup of its 5e version with clarifiers on previously confusing features. However, there is a weird hiccup with Font of Inspiration, where there isn't an action cost to its second paragraph indicating how often that can be used. That's murky at the very least. 
I still think I prefer systems with a spellless infinite inspiration creating Bard, at least for my own taste. Bard gets a Squire Bullet. I mean, you want an Offender Telecaster, but you take what you can get. Cleric has some cleanups to the base class and didn't lose the playstyle modularity granted through its domain first level features. In some ways, I can really appreciate the Divine Order change. Now not all War Domain Clerics have to be frontline tanks, and not all Light Clerics have to be blasters. It is more expression, not less, and it really did alleviate a lot of my concerns I had about moving subclasses up, for the Cleric in particular, um, up into the third level. However, we have a really weird operation issue around Spirit Guardians turning Clerics into a fucking wood chipper, since the damage taken is once per turn, not once per round. This is especially worrying with the questionable movement changes, since you can now choose to fail the saves that move you on a turn. It's a lot. Cleric gets a flying lawnmower. It's cool, but I'm terrified of how it's going to land and hope that you didn't leave the blades turned on. Uh, Druid was already a fairly complex class to pilot in 5e, and I feel the changes exacerbate the problem. It's essentially a nature cleric palette swap without a real sense of individual class identity outside of wild shape. The changes made to Wild Shape with temporary hit points is questionable when you look at the changes also made to Armor of Agathus and the fact that it's a bonus action now rather than an action. The subclasses all have a fresh envisioning with clearly defined and unique playstyles. This would be fantastic if they weren't also exacerbating this class's complexity issues. I gotta give this druid an awkward turtle due to how overly wordy the entire package is despite making a mechanically stronger druid. It's not unplayable, but boy, it isn't graceful. Fighters keeping it simple and clean and might be the massive winner from the weapon mastery changes. I'd take so much of this version of the class over the 5e version if it weren't for this whole clumsy new weapon mastery subsystem. Finally embracing second wind and action surge as the asymmetrical elements of the class and using them for new class features is a huge plus here. Noteworthy in the subclasses is just how much Champion came out with some of the best and healthiest buffs of any option in the entire book. Ignoring my qualms with weapon masteries, Fighter gets a sword held to the sky by a man with rippling abs. Okay, so Monk. With an up damage die, the changes made to unarmed strikes, and freebie bonus action disengage, Monk already got some, like, super, super healthy buffs. The glow up here is impressive, and arguably one of the worst classes in D&D just rose to the throne as a top three class contender. However, I personally just look at the Dancer Bard and wish it functioned more like that if I'm just being honest. I'm not a fan of the focus point subsystem now having to apologize for itself with more features added to complicate how it regenerates. It just feels like they wanted to get rid of focus and key restrictions, but they were too scared to experiment. Since this might be a complicated critique to throw out there for something that is inarguably improved, I put the work into design a monk class chassis that didn't use focus points for anything at all. When I'm sure it's all legally kosher for me to make public, I'll make it available for free under the fan content policy on my Patreon. Monk actually is getting a polished turn. Our Divine Smiting brother appears to be in an operational crisis, with Divine Smite now becoming a spell that requires a bonus action after you make the attack. This now limits Smite to once per turn, which means the extra attack takes a hit for the pally. Whether this kills the class for you is your take to make. If you're mixing and matching 2024 and 2014 like I know some tables will, I'm pretty sure we're going to see a preference for the 2014 Smite. Pretty much everything else is a cleanup to prevent stacking auras with multiple paladins and giving you a horse. Because of that, I'm, uh, I don't know, I'll also give it a horse. Ranger. Yeah, Watsy just fucking hates this class. If somehow this thing is awesome through some weird interaction going on with Hunter's Mark that I just haven't caught yet, then that's there, but I'm not going to munchkin out some single build that apparently makes the entire class good. That's just not the way that I think, like, character option design should really work out. I don't know, if someone found out a way to, like, this specific weapon mastery, this specific build, these specific perks, what the hell ever, I'm just completely not interested. Building characters really shouldn't be a fucking puzzle for your games. I'm giving this a morning Aragorn. So, I'm apparently going to be the dissenting opinion on the rogue. I actually like a lot of what's happening with this class. Without getting into DPR calculations, mechanically this rogue is one of the coolest representations of this archetype. My only wish for the base class is that Cunning Strike maybe could have come online at first level, but I know that suddenly that getting Sneak Attack and then getting this other thing feels like it would be a lot for L1 loadout. I've also talked about the Arcane Trickster's design quirks in the past, and I, I don't know, I might go back and redo that video kind of looking at it here. Essentially, it's still the same, but I know that that really pissed off Redditors, so like, I don't know, I might just redo it to like rustle their jimmies again. I'm also personally offended that the Mastermind Scouter Swashbuckler didn't make it into the core instead of the Soul Knife. 
I guess they have a hard on for psychic characters at the moment, but I don't know. Anyways, the rogue is getting a uh, gentlemanly round of applause. Sorcerer finally has some more definite asymmetry established from the wizard, and I'm impressed with just how much cleaner the base package looks. Meta magic options appear to have been gone through with a fine tooth comb to try and catch some niche troublesome interactions, despite the fact that some do kind of still occur. With I don't, we'll get there. Things look better. Things are improved. The wild magic sorcerer's table looks to be generally at least neutral, if not beneficial effects. Instead of just randomly fireballing you and potentially TPKing your party, there are aspects here that show thoughtful change. The thing else I would really be getting into with that is just sort of like my own personal qualms. I'm looking at Clockwork Soul, basically, is like the big one. But anyways, uh, yeah, Sorcerer is getting, um, I don't know, a couple of fireworks. Pew, pew, pew. All right, Warlock, I, I still can't believe they kept Eldritch Blast as a spell instead of a class feature. Uh, that, whatever. Um, that, happy to see Celestial's been brought over here, but... Everything else that's kind of going on with the short rest stuff, it just feels really symptomatic of D&D &D being a tracking heavy system, and they don't want it to be a tracking heavy system, so they feel like they're going to just continue to give you regeneration features, and at that point it's like, well, we get to a point where the return on the power of these is not really great, because now we just have all these resources all the time. I don't know, um, I'm not really a big fan of what they did with the Warlock here, in general, because it feels like they keep giving features that tell you to track something and then they give you features later on that are like well you don't have to track that thing much anymore really or at all no here you go you just get an infant i just i don't know i don't really like design that apologizes for itself um yeah warlock is getting a missed opportunity a aside from the fun expertise like feature granted its second wizard got rushed out the door with what feels like minimal impact overall i'm giving this one uh, two stale grapes all right so we're done with classes let's move on to the character sheet guide now the only character sheet we see in the core rulebook is stamped with numbers indicating how the sheet is supposed to be filled in. Not only is this guide questionable in how effective it does what it intends to do, there's no photocopyable character sheet in the entire core rulebook. Now, when a book isn't an 8.5x11 print, we tend to look past this. For example, Shadow Dark, Merkborg, and Old School Essentials don't have a photocopyable character sheet, but they're all US trade print or smaller and offer a PDF. From what I've heard, WotC announced that there will be a PDF version available for free, but I just wish a single spread of this book had been spent on a blank. Not the worst thing in the world, so this is only getting a frowny clowny. Weapon Masteries. So, the biggest shakeup with this that has everyone talking is the Weapon Masteries. This change has essentially packed cantrip level utility into attacks. This definitely makes marshals do more, but it also means more calculations, more time, and more complexity. If that's the kind of thing you want, it's here. Of all of them, Toffel appears to be the most problematic child. To paraphrase Kibble Stacy's thoughts on this, Toffel triggering a saving throw on every hit isn't a game-breaking bug, but it's extremely obnoxious. A level 8 fighter with a quarterstaff, polearm master, and shield master triggers something like 4 plus saves. The one change I think people are sleeping on that has bigger implications for weapons is the fact that you can now swap equipment as a part of making an attack. Note that that's not once per action, that's one per attack instance. What's been discovered with this is that weapon swapping in tandem with the masteries causes a pretty huge burst of control from one character who will always just wind up ending all these swaps with a shield in hand. I guess this is intended because this was discovered back during the unearthed arcana phases and hit print without change. To illustrate this, this is how this loop feels with swapping an extra attack. Step 1, roll the hit with a topple weapon. Step 2, if you hit, roll damage. Step 3, check to see if the target passes the save. Step 4, if it passes, repeat steps 1 to 3. If it fails, it's prone and you switch to push, sap, or slow weapons to stack on more detriments for the DM to track. Step 5, end all of your attacks by equipping a shield. Something feels wrong here, and I don't think the solution is to just throw this back at the players with your enemies. If weapon masteries weren't a thing, or if the swap as a part of an action was limited to once per turn, this might be fine. I'm genuinely curious how this is intended to function, because no read I'm getting of the book feels right. This is getting a bundled up Nessa Christmas slice you spent four hours untangling, only to find out they don't work. The adventuring gear section is going to make a lot of the heavy simulationist people happy. Each item has been expressed with a block of mechanical text in a way that I feel honestly kind of over codifies these things that have traditionally been left up to common sense rulings. Other games have expressed items affecting interactions in more elegant ways such as a plus one to three bonus for applicable checks in some year zero engine games. 
From a layout perspective, I'm not sure why each item needed its own header and space before. This information could have easily been presented on a single spread, but the formatting here splits it across five or so pages. This whole thing is just kind of getting a brain fog. I've seen quite a lot of discussions going on around the crafting section. People feeling unsatisfied with the presented rules, talking about this like it only reprinted the 5e crafting rules, that this isn't an improvement, yada yada yada. When I wrote my alchemist class, I wanted it to embrace the 5e crafting rules so it wasn't expecting people to take on a brand new subsystem. In all reality, the 5e crafting rules aren't terrible. They're just not giving people the ability to instantly craft certain things you'd want to, a la Minecraft or Elden Ring. The rules here are a very, very slight expansion on the 5e rules, and it does present them more cleanly. The problem is, it just doesn't go in as hard on shorter time crafting like the majority of people want. I'm giving this one a hammer trying to drive a screw. Spell Balance This new system comes with plenty of spell combinations that have way too much murkiness in their operation to remain unchanged for this edition. Armor of Agathus looks like it was buffed from its 5e version, now not only costing a bonus action, but also just remaining while you have temporary hit points from any source, not just those granted by Armor of Agathus. However, I've heard some people still read this as the imagined moment where you can choose to take the new temporary hit points, that's suddenly meaning there's some imagined nanosecond where you don't have THP and therein the spell ends. For me, that's way too hidden of an interpretation if that is the case. I'll also continue claiming that this thing needs to cap at a 5th slot level for scaling. Fine Traps was also seemingly nerfed to, like, not cover metaphorical traps in a way. There was a really funny, not even say exploit, I would just say interpretation of the spell, where you could potentially look at, like, a legal document, and this was a whole thing over on Reddit. Uh, not that it was anything super powerful, but it seems like for some reason they've nerfed it to where it specifically says a physical, like, a trap trap. Like, it has to be, like, a a trap with parts that are whatever the uh, yeah i don't know why they would really change it it was funny um yeah it, it got nerfed giant insect oddly shines as one of the best lockdown options with its web shot causing a no save drop to zero speed on a hit combine this with the new spirit guardians and you just put that thing through a fucking wood chipper true strike changing to a gish cantrip that allows you to add your modifier to the damage it deals and makes the weapons damage radiant makes it one of, if not the best cantrip in the entire game for single ability dependent caster builds. All of that pales in comparison to Conjure Minor Elementals comboing with spells like Scorching Ray or Eldritch Blast, since Conjure Minor Elementals is scaling at 2d8 per attack per slot level instead of the much more reasonable 1d8 per attack per slot level. This also does insane numbers when combined with spell scrolls, since they aren't limited to the one leveled spell per turn rule. Dipping into Thief Rogue to pop it as a bonus action, or any of the other combos people have conceived, can get you tapping into over 500 damage per turn. Everyone seems pretty mystified as to why this thing hits like a truck, so don't be expecting this one to remain unnerfed for the entirety of this book's lifespan. That's before getting into the spells that have been known to be troublesome in their operation for the entirety of 5th edition that went without change. As printed, this one's getting an arcane mishap. Okay, so I'm filing this one here at the end because I'm not really sure if this is a, a ding or a, a positive here. I actually do think that this would be more of a positive because they seem to have removed contested checks and group checks from the core. I think that any kind of variation that they were making outside of just the basic like D20 resolution, how does that interact with advantage disadvantage? Probably a good idea for them to go forth and do this, but I'm making a note here because I don't know, if in the future there is something that prints like contested checks in another book, we would circle back on this and be like, wait, but you guys don't have this rule actually present in this thing. And if they, they were to say like, well, look at the 2014 version, I'm going to be like, but why the fuck could you not put it in there? Yeah, I don't know. Um, It looks like they've removed it. From what I could tell from the book, it seems that they are just getting rid of those in the system overall. So yeah, just making a note of that. I, I don't know whether I would call that a if that's the intention and they have actually implemented that fully, I would actually agree with the change and say that that's pretty good. If they just forgot it, I'd be like, that's a whole other world. In general, this new edition just feels like a collection of house rules instead of a polished revision. I personally believe the future historians of D&D &D will look back on the 2024 facelift as a rushed, unforced error. This project's job wasn't intended to be okay as an option, it was intended to replace 5e. If you look at it by that metric, I don't think Wizards of the Coast will have succeeded. However, if you look at this as a variety of optional rules that may patch your pre-existing 5e game for you to pick and choose from, there's probably some value you'll get out of this. 
I've had an awesome time making content for other systems, and this honestly kind of felt like sending a drunk text to an ex or going to my high school homecoming three years after I graduated. I've seen other sites, I've made other friends, I've experienced new things, and the nostalgia of this return trip made me unsure what I was really wanting out of it in the first place. There might be a game or two I'll play as a one-shot with friends, but my preference for running planned campaigns and making worlds is firmly suited in cleaner, easier to grok systems that don't require three hours for combat. But with that, I'm just going to leave you to make your own decisions based off of whatever perspectives you can find. I hope mine was at least informative. And with that, I want to give a shout out to my Patreon sponsors. Thank you all so much for helping me keep the lights on around here and coffee in my blood. You all are absolute heroes. Link to my Patreon and all that is going to be down in the description below. And another thank you to Buckstar Games for sponsoring this review. Please go check them out in the description. Hope you all are staying safe, staying healthy, and I'll see you in the next one.